More now on our in-depth look at recycling in Canada. If you're of a certain age, you'll remember when it all started here 30 years ago. It was a hopeful and truly a simpler time. You bundled up the newspapers, and a few years later, you got to put all the glass and the tins in that same blue bin. Well, now recycling programs are much bigger, and there's more cost, too. For some people, there's also a lot of confusion over just what goes into the blue bin. So over the course of the next few hours, we're going to try to sort all that out with Mark Badger, who's the executive vice president of Canada Fibres. That's a major recycling company in Ontario. It is responsible, just so you know all the details, for sorting and processing recyclables for 14 communities across Ontario. So that's about 60% of the province's blue bin waste. Mr. Badger, thank you for coming in today. Thanks for having us. We have viewer questions for you. We're going to talk about what goes in, what doesn't go in, and over the course of, as I said, the next couple of hours, uh, we'll try to sort some of these things out. But because of just how involved you are in Ontario's recycling system, you know the Ontario picture very well, can you give us a national picture? I'd like to start generally. How well do we do in Canada at recycling? So uh, if we benchmark against other places in the world, not so good. No. Uh, we, in uh, Canada, about 22-23% of post-consumer plastics materials go on to another life through recycling programs. That compares in contrast to the better places in the world, like Belgium and Germany and so on, where they do over double that. And I like to think of that as an opportunity. There's more to as, do, but that's not even a quarter. Well. It isn't even a quarter of what's possible. Uh, and uh, we all play a role in uh, making these programs successful. And you're absolutely right. We must be vigilant to put things in a blue bin. More. Okay, so we're going to look at how to do this more effectively. But what what is the main stumbling block, as you see it right now, to why that number is as low as it is? Well, I think there is genuine confusion uh, amongst households on what can go in and what can't go in. And I think we all share a responsibility to promote and educate the right things mm -hmm. and to help people to understand the wrong things. Uh, because when somebody puts something in a blue bin that shouldn't be there, it can contaminate many of the other valuable materials. It also can you know, cause health and safety issues. I think that's a really important point, the contamination. The figure that I was reading, maybe you can correct me, is about 25% of what we think we're putting in the proper place. 25% is contaminated. So that requires people's pilling it out. It adds to the cost. It ruins the effectiveness of the program overall. So cross-contamination... A big, big issue. One of the other issues is what we put in the blue box now. We were showing the simpler time. You know, it was papers, it was tin cans. Now it's plastics. It's plastics because of a changing lifestyle. This is really what's driving this whole shift, isn't it? It is, but we have to remember those plastics are very valuable, uh, and the people that are putting them into a blue box and doing it responsibly after cleaning them out uh, are doing a wonderful thing. They're helping us to preserve natural resources. They're curbing the amount of greenhouse gas that gets emitted. You know, in our company, we keep track of the number of trees we save as a result of our recycling efforts. And on an annual basis, I'm proud to tell you that our 700 or so employees uh, keep 4 million trees in the forest where they belong, get, giving us oxygen to breathe. Well, that's the aim. Okay, well, bringing up trees and what we use for certain things. Let's get into some viewer-specific questions. Speaking of trees, coffee cups, disposable coffee cups. Canada, Canadians, use about 1.5 to 2 billion disposable coffee cups a year. It's more in the UK. It's billions. Here's our question. Uh, this is... Well, this is um, this is the next question, actually. If you can, well, I tell you what. Can we go back to the first question, if you don't mind, which from Liz Head, the email that we got? Uh, and what Liz Head from On Sound wrote was, take out coffee cups, one of the biggest recycling problems. If people were charged a dollar for each throwaway cup, they would soon take their own, me included. But this is a huge issue because of that plastic lining inside the paper cup. It means that they can't be recycled uh, in, a, in an economical, in a proper way. What do we do about coffee cups? Well, first of all, we have to thank Liz for the question. Right. It's a great question. It's on everybody's mind. Unfortunately, 
uh, the coating that's on the coffee cups and in many cases the amount of ink that's on the coffee cups makes it very, very expensive to put into a form that it can be used and, and, and recycled. We need to work together. We need to work together to design a coffee cup that's more readily recyclable. And I got to tell you that this industry is up for that challenge. Starbucks just announced another major project, although it did say it was supposed to have a recyclable cup by 2015, and it has not got that yet, but it's starting on another study. Interesting, though, one thing to keep in mind, is this not right? You can throw away the, 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 um, the paper sleeve, and you can throw away the cap as long as it's not black. So in many cases, uh, municipalities do take the caps. There's valuable plastic in it. Let's recycle it where we can. Okay. And um, in, in some communities, even black caps can be used. If the caps were a light color generally, that would help us to recover more. All right. Caps, sleeves for now, and solutions for the cups. But that's one of the big issues. And one other question right now, uh, before we take a pause and bring you back, and that was the a, a question we showed you earlier from uh, Tom Fromager, and an interesting comment. Here's what gets me. When I was a kid, stores gave you your purchases in paper bags, milk and soda came in reusable bottles with a deposit. So what you're saying is we should just have stayed that way. The, the idea of a deposit. Yes, we've got it in wine bottles. Yes, we got it in beer cans and things like that. What about would it be, would that kind of a deposit system be of value? That's one approach. It does work some places in the world. I will tell you it's a long road between introduction, introduction of a system like that and when you get to substantial behavioral change. I don't think it's the only road. I think the better road is using the blue box as it's intended. There's 900,000 tons a year that go into blue boxes. If we can eradicate the contamination and make sure we get in there what we can, uh, much more valuable resource can go on to another life. So that is more effective than, than paying people to take their pop bottles back as we used to do. It works in some places, okay. but people have become very uh, familiar with the blue box or the blue bin and and to to ask them to go to a store to get a deposit for for a bottle maybe asking a little much if we ask them to do it overnight could it be part of the solution absolutely but the blue bin has tremendous potential if we use it correctly. We have viewer questions, which we're going to get to. But we, you can sort of play this game at home, because what I want to begin with this hour is there's our blue bin. We recognize that, like in the invention from 30 years ago, and all sorts of props that Mark has brought in. And we're going to sort out what can go in and what can't go in, because there's still a lot of confusion, isn't there? There sure is, and it's interesting that you bring up that confusion. At dinner parties, we play a game, and we play a game that's called what can go in and what can't go in. Okay, let's Here, play that this morning then. Here's a very good example of something that universally goes into uh, uh, the blue box, Okay. and, and that's a, a beverage bottle. And you should know that 25 of these recovered and recycled can make a fleecy jacket. So very, very valuable material to recover. In it goes. Okay, let's go through more of those. Cereal box? Cereal box or a newspaper. No brainer? No brainer should go in, but in people need to know this. One ton of th these materials can save 15 trees from being cut down. And we have to remember, trees give us the oxygen we okay. need in order to breathe. Put those in, blue bottle, blue into the blue bin. Egg containers. This too is a is a plastic material that's mm -hmm. very valuable. It's an egg container. It's a number one plastic. It's called PET. Again, this could make a jacket, make another egg container, or a drink bottle. So not all plastic is bad. We have to keep that in mind. There are plastics that can go into the blue bin. Absol another case in point. Absolutely. This is a, uh, a yogurt cup. This yogurt cup can go on to become a building product. Mm -hmm. It can go on to be uh, become another container. Could be a shampoo bottle. Could be a, a detergent bottle or something or something like that. Importantly, though, very, very importantly, we need people not to leave a little bit of yogurt in because a little bit of yogurt in this container can contaminate a ton worth of paper and render it unmarketable. So contamination, we talked last hour, this is a big problem and it's about 25%, isn't it? Is that the number that you work with? Is contaminated that we lose? 
So it varies community by community. I will tell you that in North America, some of the worst communities are in the area of 30, 33%. In North America, some of the better communities hover around 10%. Yeah, we can do a better job, which is a wonderful segue. Rinse it out. Okay, pop that in. Now, this stuff does not go in. Let's go through these quickly, Mark, and then I'll get on to some questions here. So, electrical cords. So, so daily we see electrical cords go through the, the 14 facilities that we have in the province. And, you know, these contaminate, they cause damage to equipment, and heaven forbid one of our sorters tries to pull something like this out, it gets wrapped around them. VHS tapes are another popular blooper. Uh, seems that everybody is getting rid of their VHS tapes <laughs> through the blue box. <laughs> one would have thought years ago, but anyway, don't do that. Please don't. Do not. Okay, well, let's not put those in. We don't want to confuse the message. Let's just pile them out on the desk. These do not go in. Okay, well now done. this is a fact, propane canister. Here. Who would throw that in there? So we're coming up on camping season, and every year we see literally thousands of these go through. And what people have to understand is a propane container with some propane in it plus an appliance like this that may have a battery in it, this plus this e. can equal an explosion, which is really not a good thing for no. anybody. Yeah, quickly, um, food, that's green bin. You're talking about that, lemon? Importantly, though, organics within the Blue Box program are really on the rise across North America. We just urge homeowners to be vigilant okay. in terms of using the containers as they're intended. All right, and textiles, we've talked about that recently. They're just sitting in mountains. Give those away. Donate those or, or you know, find creative ways. Okay, viewer questions, because uh, I want to get to David Johnson's question. I understand from something I recently read that Sweden recycles most of its trash by burning. The resulting emissions are 99% clean. Only 1% of trash goes into landfill. Why aren't we doing this? So, David, it's an excellent observation that you make. And in places like Sweden, what they do is they get everything that they can recycled before they send the rest on to create energy from waste. So they have a very, very high diversion rate there. David, it's interesting to note in a place close to home here in Durham, there is an energy from, from waste facility, a facility that makes energy from residual materials that can't be recycled. Durham has a very high diversion rate. Mm -hmm. They recycle what they can, and then the rest goes on to become energy. That's the right thing to do. And this is what people are looking at. These are some of the alternatives that... More and more recycling will work in tandem with, with, energy, reco with energy recovery from waste to create a higher diversionary solution. And Durham is a, is a poster okay. child for what's possible. We talked about um, coffee just a few minutes ago, that black lid, which is a problem, uh, which is difficult to recycle. David Starr wants to know, why does the city permit companies to supply black plastic containers if those containers are not accepted material for recycling? So another good question, but David uh, really isn't in the city's purview to say what can and can't be put into a packaging. It's incumbent upon all of us to work together, including recyclers like us, to work with the manufacturers of packaging to design things that are more readily recyclable. We have people on staff who do that. Mm -hmm. It is part of our responsibility as a servant to the public. You know, you think of the pressure that's been brought to bear on Starbucks to get a more environmentally friendly, and I'm not the only coffee chain, obviously, but there's a lot of consumer pressure because people are concerned about these issues, so keep up the pressure. Last one, this is from Beth. Can you explain why hard plastics cannot be recycled? In my house, there are decades of worn out toothbrushes stored in tins, waiting for the day when they will be part of the blue box program. Uh, explain that one to us. So Beth, I want you to keep thinking like that. In fact, I want all the viewers to keep thinking about things that could be recycled. The toothbrush example, uh, it has a hard layer typically in the middle and a softer layer on the outside of the toothbrush makes it a little difficult to recycle. But you know what? That's another shining example of what if we put our heads to, we could design better so it's more readily recyclable. Keep thinking that way, Beth.
pressure on companies, pressure on elected officials to expand programs and come up with alternative solutions. Thank you for answering the questions. Thank you for your questions. And thank you for this, because amazingly, we still need the reminder to use this properly. All right. Thank you for having us, Heather. Pleasure to have you in. Mark Badger, Executive Vice President of Canada Fibre. So we'll be keeping that conversation going here on CBC News Network. You're welcome to send us more questions, more sustainable solution ideas. You can tweet them to us at CBC Morning Live, email morninglive at cbc.ca. And don't forget about that direct message through the CBC News Facebook page.